he teaches people to become millionaires. Today, hear his money-making secrets. It was life-changing and just woke me up. Went from 48 to 100,000 one year. What do the rich teach their children about money that the poor and middle class do not? Robert Kiyosaki teaches people to be millionaires. He teaches people to be millionaires. That's how he earned the nickname, the millionaire school teacher. And he says that the rich have a very different way of thinking about money that anybody can learn. His book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, has been on the New York Times business bestseller list for eight months. And his unique advice may change the way you look at your money. This is a really important show. If you like money, if you need money, if you'd like to have some money, this is a show for you. Take a look. I've been rich and I've been poor, and I like rich much better. I found out that the secret to success is not hard work or luck. I found a new way of thinking that works for me. Do you remember these here? These are nylon and Velcro surfer wallets. When I was 26, I began marketing these products worldwide, and that's how I became a millionaire before I was 30. Besides building businesses, I also invest in stocks as well as real estate. I was able to retire at the age of 47. Today I teach other people how to build businesses or to be investors. I must say I owe much of my financial success to a man I call my rich dad, who was my childhood best friend's father. He made me realize that there's a very big difference between what the rich teach their kids about money that the poor don't teach their kids about money. My real dad, or my biological father, was the head of education for the state of Hawaii. I call him my poor dad simply because he was a high-paid government official. He made a lot of money, yet at the end of every month, he was broke. My rich dad, on the other hand, was my best friend's father, he, and he ultimately became one of the wealthiest men in the state of Hawaii. And by the way, my rich dad was a high school dropout. One dad had a habit of saying, I can't afford it. My rich dad, on the other hand, forbade his son and I from ever saying, I can't afford it. My poor dad always said, our house is an asset, and it's our largest investment. My rich dad said, your house is not an asset, it's a liability, and if it's your largest investment, you're in financial trouble. My poor dad believed in job security. He said, look for a company that had excellent pay, good benefits such as medical, vacation, and other types of perks. My rich dad said that that entitlement mentality kept people financially weak and financially needy. My poor dad always said, find a safe, secure job and work your way up the corporate ladder. My rich dad said, why not just own the ladder? I decided to listen and learn from my rich dad. The rest is history. Well, let's go through some more of Robert's points about what he says. The rich teach their children that the poor and middle class do not. Main difference, you say, between the rich and poor lies in what we teach our children? About That's money, correct. really. Very much so. I had, and it's a mentality. It's a total way of thinking, right? Exactly. Yes. And it's really easy to change if you want to change the way you think. For instance, my, my poor dad was a very good man for Japanese. He was six foot four, very smart, academic genius. But he always said to me, you know, go to school, get good grades, get a job and work hard, save money. And my rich dad said, well, if you want to be rich, that's not the way you do it. And he, instead of working for money, my rich dad taught me how to have money work hard for me. And that's why I've only had a job four years of my entire life. Other than that, if I'm building companies or I'm investing, and that's all I'm doing. Well, the subject of money is taught at home, not in school, you say, because most of us learn about money from our parents, and it's only good if you have a rich dad mentality. My message to people is, you know, why struggle for money when you don't have to? You know, it's that really simple if you have good advice. The problem is money is not taught in school. And so what we do is we oftentimes follow in our parents' footsteps. We may do different jobs, but we oftentimes follow in the same financial patterns. And my rich dad used to say, you know, he says, you can't, you can't end poverty by giving somebody money. Giving a poor person money keeps them poor longer. Yeah. And that's what breaks my heart because I want to help people. Change the way they think yes, about money. That's all it is. Yeah. And I think one of the most important things is that I noticed when I think my rich dad and my poor dad was the vocabulary. My poor dad you was know, a PhD in education, very smart man, but he had the vocabulary of a school teacher. And my rich dad had the vocabulary of a rich man. And so when I say to people, what's the first thing? What do you mean by vocabulary? Well, I know what the word means, but right. what kind of vocabulary? 
Well, my, my, uh, I sit around the dinner table and listen to both dads, and one would talk about algebra and geometry and trigonometry. Nothing that ever made me any money. Mm -hmm. And my rich dad would sit there and he'd talk about return on investment, assets, liabilities, <laughs> discounted cash flows, etc. And a lot of people, you, uh, you know, what you just said about your house is a liability, it's not an asset. Most people think it is their biggest investment. Yes, and that's the one of the biggest middle class traps. They say, my banker says my house is an asset. And my rich dad would say, if you can read a financial statement, you'll see, you can read that your house is actually a liability. I'm not saying don't buy a house. Mm -hmm. And I like big houses, and I like the finer things of life. Just don't call a liability an asset. And what's trapping the middle class is they're buying liabilities they think are assets. I like the, what you say in the book, which this is interesting too, because I've been, always been a person who lived beneath my means. Now it's kind of hard to see, you know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but I've always been a person who, because I just was reading about how the Chevy Chevette was the worst car, one of the worst cars ever made, and I had one of those little tin right. cans because <laughs> that was the thing that I could pay cash for and not have to, you right. know, pay interest and so forth. Right. So I've always believed in living beneath the means until you could really afford to That's pay for correct. stuff, mainly because I hate bills, Right. just hate bills. And you say one of the mistakes that middle class and poor people do is they try to look rich. Yes. So those are the first people to go buy the furs, the diamonds, the big TVs, and all the stuff, correct? Right, my, my rich dad called it looking good and going nowhere. <laughs> Love that. Yeah, my grandmother used to call it not a pot to piss in. But anyway, that's what I <laughs> kind of the same thing. <laughs> I'm glad you said that. You heard that too. Okay, they'll edit that somewhere. But anyway, it's the same principle. You have all yes. this stuff. I know when I see people out and they got all the stuff and all the things and they love the guy. But then when they go home, what? They have bills. They have bills. And they worry and their health goes down and, you know, it's not worth it. The thing that I think most people don't realize is that there's only two kinds of money problems, basically. One's not enough money and one's too much money. And they're both problems. And you really know, you have to know how to handle too much money, as I'm sure you do right now. Otherwise, if you... <laughs> Watching it all the time. It's, it's, Had a bad it, week last week. Yeah. But it's a different problem. Yeah, it's it? a different kind of problem. Yeah. So when you have no money, you have to have a plan to eventually have plenty of money. And then when you have plenty of money, you've got to shift plans. Yes. And so that's why people who win the lottery all of a sudden get all this plenty of money, and they go broke again. And overwhelmed by it. Right, and they go because they've never understood how money worked. Paul Rogers says he changed from a poor dad to a rich dad and now wakes up every day with a new outlook on life. Here's what Paul's story is. Paul Rogers, a divorced father of two, was making $48,000 a year as a firefighter and living paycheck to paycheck. By the time I paid the house payment, the child support, the car payment, food and utilities, uh, with the two kids, it was, it was really tough. Last year, Paul discovered Robert Kiyosaki's financial plan. He stresses three main things. Number one, set up a home-based business. Number two, get control of your taxes. Number three, take that extra income and buy more assets with it. He followed the steps and set up his own home-based business. It was easier than he thought and only cost him $300. With that extra income from his new home business, and a pay raise from the firehouse of $300 a month, he started to buy homes that were in foreclosure. You can purchase them under value, go in, carpet, paint them, fix them up, turn and sell them, and even make more money. With the money he made from selling those houses, Paul bought stocks, mutual funds, IRAs, and even set up an educational account for his children. It has changed my outlook on life because this has given me more time freedom with my kids and more financial freedom. And the best thing is my income's gone from about 48000 to a little over 100000 in a one-year period. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I bet you're impressed with yourself. <laughs> uh, I'm impressed with uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad in the book. It's just an unbelievable book. You're going to have a great response from all your viewers on this. Really? You sound like an infomercial, but we're not. <laughs> It obviously has changed your life, your outlook, and what you will now pass on to your children. Yeah, really, uh, the educational system, educational system that I had growing up didn't teach me about debt, credit card debt, liabilities, college loans, you know, getting that fancy car right out of school. But what Britt and Chelsea are learning now is that, hey, you know, make your money work for you, don't work for money. So it's been a, it's been a big life-changing experience for me. So what exactly, because now people are going, what exactly caused you to go from 48 to 100 in a year? Well, that's, that's a very good question. I think what it was was, number one, I sat down and I actually wrote out what my goals were and what my dreams were, and I had never done that before. 
And when I actually wrote those on paper, I said to myself, well, how am I going to get there? What do I need to do? And that's what probably a lot of the viewers are going to say, yeah, this all sounds good, but tell me the answer. Well, the answer for me was I set up a home-based business. By doing so, it only cost me $300. I'm generating income from that and taking that income, buying real estate, put it in uh, to the stock market, stuff like that. Buying more assets in my life and having my money work for me. But you also kept your other job. I'm still a full-time fireman. I plan on keeping that. I thoroughly enjoy my job. Yeah. Um, we but, love firemen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have me on the singles show. Yeah, I will. <laughs> Wait a minute. You don't need to. Yeah. I'm here. You don't need a show. Call the Oprah show and give me a call. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so your whole life has changed. Yeah, pretty much I've got just a great outlook. I mean, when I wake up every day now, it's just like, there's all kinds of opportunity out there, but it's really taking that first step and saying, you know, why am I here? You know, what do I want to do? Where do I want to go? Well, one of the things you say is that the poor pay their bills first, the rich pay themselves first. That's a tough, that's a really tough one, but it makes people kind of crazy. Yeah. Because, the, you know, the from richest man in Babylon says pay yourself first, but what most people do is they pay their bills first and they never pay themselves anything. And that's a discipline I had to get into, was I was paying myself first, even when I had no money. And when I have all these bill collectors calling me, I use them as inspiration, <laughs> you know what I really? mean? Really? Oh, when they're hounding, the government's hounding you, bill collectors calling, because I've been broke, so I can, you know, understand what it feels like to be broke. When those guys are calling you, instead of, you know, shrinking and going into the shell and eating my pizza, yeah. I use it as motivation to go out and make more money. So I use, it, I use my bill collectors as motivation and that's why I paid myself first, even though sometimes what I was What would you pay yourself? I always bought assets. I'd buy a house or I'd put money in the bank and things like this. But uh, it was just a habit. And it, well, exactly what you're talking about. It's up here. It's about changing the way you think. You that's the, what the whole book is about. That's it. Because we're our biggest asset. We're also our biggest liability. We are. Yeah, we are. I know. Yes. I read that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. During the commercial break, you said what? Stand up. Say it again. You say that uh, you, can, you can pay yourself first pay your bill second, but if you do that, you still can't afford to pay, to buy a house. Say, you say you bought a house. How am I gonna get somebody to loan me the money to buy a house when I can't pay my, and when I can't fully pay my bills as I'm paying them now? When I'm paying the minimum, minimum payment, let's say that. How am he I doesn't go, understand how am the principle of pay yourself first. Loan? He's with a lot of people out there who are saying, look, I got the bill collectors calling, I'm scared to answer the phone because I, I don't have the money, so how am I going to now give myself money first when I got these people knocking down my door? That's what all these people are shaking their heads to. They're, right. they're thinking easy for you to say from where you're sitting now. Well, I sell. I'm a salesman. I go, to, I go to work every day and I try to sell more and more and more to make more and more money, but that money's still going to my bills, so I'm not getting called by the credit collectors. One thing that Paul said right there, he starts a home-based business, the tax laws are written against, tax laws are not equal. And if you want, what I'm saying is got to get educated here. So the tax laws are not equal. So if you're an employee and you work harder and harder, the government's going to take 50% no matter what. So by being a business owner, this was, which is Paul did, he has tax advantages that the middle class and poor do not have. It's just, the taxes are the biggest expense in your life as a salesman. The more money you make, the more the government takes. So get control of your taxes first by setting up a home-based business. Take that tax savings now, pay down debt, and buy more assets in the real estate. And you said, well, well I've got credit problems. I'm not going to be able to get a loan. Find a motivated seller. Find owner financing. There's all kinds of opportunities out there. Most of society, though, will watch this show and then they'll go back to just sitting at home at night. You really have to change what you're doing in your life if you're not happy where you're at financially. You've got to do something drastically. Just saving money and investing is not enough. There is a complete mindset that goes on. I think that's what these people who came. Paul was saying, because we all have the mentality in this country, right. you work harder, you work harder, you, it will pay off in the end. It does not, because no. the government always gets theirs. Right. Yeah. And, then, and then real estate is the least taxed income you can get. So when, when my wife and I were struggling, we saved $6,000, we bought that house, thing went, to, went from 46000 to 105. we had $50,000. But I think when people think of real estate, they think about the house that they would want to live in. So That's you start it. out buying something that you wouldn't necessarily want, and you use that to build more income. That's for what you. she did. She bought seven. Build well, that's, more that's income. My, that's my idea. I want to buy a three-plat, live in the basement, rent off the two top two apartments, Good, and thinking. have them pay my mortgage for me. Good. But I still need to come up with the original capital to buy the place. That starts with a paying yourself first. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Oprah. 
See, that's what people should be teaching in school, because I swear yes. to you, we've all been ta taught be responsible, pay your bills first so that the people don't, you know, call you or not harassing you and so forth. What were you going to say, Paul? I was, say the, I was dealing with the real estate, what, you're, what Robert's talking about, but for $300, I set up a home-based business. Anybody in this room can do that, and you're going to save money on your taxes, number one, while you're generating income on your business. Once you've got that income coming in, you can do all the real estate that you want then. So it's really just getting out there and looking at the different opportunities. $300 investment.